All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. So our uh, our next presenter is Johannes Dunn from uh, Carlsberg Institute of Technology, the CEO lab, and uh, he's going to be talking about four of those. Are you ready? So, Johannes, it's yours. Okay. So I welcome to my presentation about Bulletproof and radio. As Ben already said, my name is Johannes Dillmann. I'm currently a master student at KIT in Hartford. And also, I'm this year's social student. Okay, well, I was asked, what is SOTSIS? So it is a program run by the ESA, the European Space Agency. And it's called uh, Summer of Coding Space, in the series 2015, obviously. Uh, and that also has a very nice slogan. Um, in space, no one can hear you go. <laughs> yeah, um, unfortunately, this year, uh, Moretti didn't get a slot or multiple slots for GSOC, so um, bad luck. But we got a slot for uh, SOTIS, and I got this slot in turn. And um, yeah, so I uh, will talk a little bit about polar codes. Why polar codes? For example, if you have a space communication, uh, there you always have a fight to have a better link budget, and uh, you always try to improve it, even though it might be just a fraction of the beat. And uh, polar codes might be a promising uh, approach to that too. Have a better link budget and have a fraction of the beat uh, better. Okay, so a little bit about, about the contents of my talk. First, uh, I'll talk about some theory, about coding, uh, and then I'll go on to uh, talk about my implementation. Uh, I'll present how I approach my project. I uh, will just have a brief introduction into the FSC API. I'll have a little look at all the code info radio, and then finally, uh, uh, form comparison. Well, um, of course, I'll sum it up with a conclusion. First, about some fundamentals. So, <clears throat> we always talk about uh, channel coding or forward or co error correction or error correcting codes, whatever you want to call it. And we always have a system of, uh, you can see it up here, I, I use the mouse. This one, this model. Um, I will refer to it later on as a bit channel because you will always transmit one bit at a time. Uh, in this case, you can see a binary symmetric memory list, a symmetric binary discrete memory list channel. That's the way you put it usually. And uh, you always put in an input alphabet, which is 001. The binary, and you have an output alphabet Y. This is a uh, left arbitrary. At this point, you will choose different ones, and yeah, I'll not, I won't go into details here because uh, that's I could talk on for hours about this. Um, I just have a simple example of one of the possible channels. It's a binary symmetric channel. So uh, all of the ones are going in, and there's a uh, small cross over probability and with this information you can actually calculate a capacity for this particular channel or you can uh, calculate a factorial parameter which is a measure of reliability. Uh, it's often used in the realm of polar codes that's why I mentioned here just so you know. Okay, some more fundamentals a very easy code, a repetition code so always the ones are going in. They are repeated in this example three times. You have a code size or code word size of three. And then in the decoder, you'll just count your O's and ones and do a majority decision. So some properties of this particular code is code word size is three, input size or information bit size uh, is one, and that results in a uh, code rate one third. Uh, you can always uh, improve the error correction performance of this code by just uh, having more repetitions. But as 
you can see, you will also have lower rates, so you transmit less data. Um, well, so in the end, you can have a perfect a transmission, but unfortunately, you won't transmit any data anymore because you will either only transmit ones or zeros. Um, question is, can we do better? And the answer is yes. So, let me introduce polar codes. <clears throat> What are they? So first of all, they are all based on a paper by Ergo Arkan, uh, published in 2009. It's called Channel Polari Polarization, a method for constructing capacity achieving codes for symmetric binary input memoryless channels. We're talking about block codes, and unlike uh, the repetition codes I just introduced, they're asymptotically good. So you can increase the block size and you won't end up with uh, zero information transmitted. Uh, but, um, polar codes exploit something called channel polarization effect. I come to that shortly. And uh, just so you know, you can describe polar codes uh, by first their block size, which is always the power of two then number of information bits you would transmit in every block. So uh, that's always a number between O and uh, the block size. And then uh, trial parameters, frozen bit positions and frozen bit values. So within each block uh, you have a certain number of uh, bits you know. Um, so they are known to encoder and decoder and also they are positioned within a block. Okay. Um, so what is the channel polarization effect? Um, I was talking about this bit channel earlier and what you're going to do is you combine more and more of those channels in a certain way, I come to that shortly, and then you will uh, be able to calculate an individual channel capacity for each of those uh, bit channels and it will differ from uh, the capacity you were calculating when you just had the single channel because uh, you combine them in a certain way. So and you can see on the left side here that channel capacity times towards zero and the uh, right that channel capacity times towards one so uh, one means uh, a perfect transmission, so uh, no errors occur. Zero means uh, you just uh, receive random bits and uh, you don't transmit any information at all. Okay, so we know about this now. Uh, just so you know, calculating uh, those channel capacities uh, is a computationally very heavy task and uh, it's always done offline. But we also have an encoder and a decoder. Uh, I already mentioned it. We combine uh, those basic bit channels in a certain way. And on the upper left here, uh, you can see this basic scheme to combine two uh, bits. So solid lines indicate that you do XOR, the bits coming in from the left. So XO will equal UO XR U1 and uh, dash lines indicate that you just copy the value over from left to right. Underneath you can see uh, a code of box size H with four information bits and uh, their frozen bits all set to zero at their corresponding uh, positions. And you'll just go in uh, from left to right uh, in this case, through three stages to encode uh, one block. So you have one code word, then you transmit uh, this uh, code word through your basic bit channels here in the middle. Uh, and on the other side, you'll have a decoder. Um, you usually use uh, log likelihood ratios for a decoder because that's the easiest way 
Uh, to do so, you could also use like code ratios, but they will only make things more complicated in terms of math. So we will always stick to log like code ratios. Um, the decoder uh, we use uh, it uses something called successive cancellation. So you start with the first bit up here, and uh, you just go through uh, this decoder graph to uh, the very left of it and uh, take the log like ratios you have there. Uh, use an update rule to uh, calculate LLRs for those nodes here. Then go on, calculate uh, LLRs for this and then here. And then you do a, a decision uh, if it was a one or a zero. But in this case, it was a frozen bit, so you just said to the known value. And you go on, try to decode the second bit, third, fourth bit is actually uh, the first really interesting one, because in this case, uh, you have an information bit, and uh, you will always use the information from previous bits to decode the next one, which is actually part of this dash update rule you have. Um, but if you're interested, we can talk about that later. Um, it's just a lot of months. Okay, so now we know about uh, the theory, how pull the codes work a little bit, and uh, I will go on to my implementation. Okay, how did I approach my uh, SOSIS project? Um, you can see five uh, blocks where I grouped different tasks I did. And uh, all those uh, blocks I have uh, indicated how many weeks or which weeks I spent on those blocks. So first I started with uh, some theory. So I read some papers. I played around with uh, the mouth I read in those papers. Uh, so that actually leads me to the second part on um, Python. Python was really helpful in a way that you can just play around with the mount you have and, uh, well, visualize it. You can uh, graph, have graphs very easily. And uh, finally, after you play around with it for a while, you have a feeling for the code you use and can use it as a test code later on, which I guess is very important. At least uh, I was happy to have it. Then you move on to the C++ implementation. So um, you implement it. Uh, in my case, I integrated it in FEC API. I set up uh, my flow graph so I could just run it in GNU Radio. And uh, well, I was working that for a while, so everything works in encoder and decoder. Then uh, I went on and uh, did some profiling, so I could uh, locate hotspots where I had to think about how I could improve on my code there so it would run faster. Uh, eventually I went on and uh, implemented volt kernels for an encoder and decoder. Um, as Nathan's here in a moment. Well, anyways, he mentioned that I had some problems with that and finally got resolved. Um, yeah, and finally, uh, you may publish your code. In my case, uh, I already had everything published from day one, but still, uh, what I'm aiming for is to uh, upstream it, so uh, I want to have it integrated into the radio mainline, and I hope that will happen in the near future. Okay, so a little bit about the FEC API. So basically, the idea is that you have, uh, in this case, an encoder. Uh, you have this encoder block, you parameterize, and uh, you just drop into it as a skeleton. In this case, you can see uh, a stream skeleton, but there are also uh, those blocks for um, as, uh, asynchronous uh, encoding and decoding. And uh, the way you do it is you actually uh, inherit from uh, a class called generic encoder, which has primarily five methods you have to implement. Input and output size, obviously for block code, it's on the one hand side, the input size, 
is the number of information bits you have in each block, and the output size is the size of your code bar. Right is then obviously the rate between those two. Then you have a generic work. That's the function that gets called all the time when you, uh, during the flow code overall runs, so that's an important function. And then there's another one called set frame rec size. Uh, basically, uh, it's supposed to allow you to re uh, set the input size during runtime. Just get, that can get used for bullet codes. Uh, doesn't really make sense. Um, and then you just inherit from generic encoder and uh, implement your own encoder and, uh, in your own pods. Okay. Here is a little DRC example of all dogs you need to run Colico in the radio. Uh, yeah, so first of all, encoder and decoder variables or definitions up here. Uh, then skeleton blocks uh, in a flow block. And you can see a third block, it's called Colico configurator, this one here. Uh, this one takes care of all the other tasks that have to be done before you can run the public code uh, in your flow graph. So, um, for example, you have to know where are your frozen bits, which positions do you have, do they have. And uh, I implemented a system uh, that calculates uh, the, those channel capacities of auditorium parameters uh, I was talking about earlier. So you could have the graph um, with the channel capacity for each individual bit channel and then just choose uh, the pull, uh, frozen bit positions according uh, to uh, the channel capacities. Um, I also implemented a persistent cache here because as I mentioned, it's a computationally happy task so you don't want to recalculate those values over and over again, but just once and then just reload the, the results. So, you uh, have this configurator, you can configure your uh, encoder and decoder definitions, drop it into the FPC API skeletons, and then run your, uh, yeah, your program, and hopefully have a better results than we've uncoded. Uh, Okay, uh, a few performance comparisons. Uh, I did them using GRC. There is a QT precinct that is actively uh, uh, meant to be used in those cases. And then there are also other blocks we can use to uh, generate the values it should display. Um, We, uh, what you can see here are uh, three different codes, basically. Well, four from a, which is the theoretical line if you have no codes at all. But three different codes, the evolutional code in green, uh, a bullet code uh, which uses the standard successive cancellation decoder, and then uh, the red line is a, another, use another decoder which is more sophisticated at the expense of uh, more uh, CPU cycles you have to spend decoding, but it yields better results. Um, well, you can see that uh, those lines fed out at the bottom. That's because uh, I stopped this uh, simulation after a while, and uh, well, you can just run it until you also obtain values up down there, but um, at higher uh, SNR values or. Uh, bits to noise value, um, bit energy to noise values, it just takes an awful long time, so you don't want to wait for it. Okay, um, and what you can see is apparently it works better than a conversion code. So, um, that's a nice result, I guess. Um, I was a gun my conclusion already. Uh, first, <coughs> some lessons learned. Uh, I always recommend start with Python code. You could use another system, like uh, MATLAB, but uh, you're later on run into the problem that you want to have 
have some test code and uh, expect it for no radio or anything else which is outside this MATLAB IDE it is just way easier to have something else. So use Python code, it has all the things you need. It's a great tool. Also, uh, you know that not all of those no radio blocks have test code, but it's really important. Uh, whenever there is a block that is a little bit more complicated than just multiplying something, uh, you need it to verify that your block works as expected. Uh, we bring you to the next point. Uh, C++ code always works. <laughs> uh, and um, also, uh, I had the chance to learn a lot about Vault, how it works, how it's supposed to be. Uh, and to learn about SIMD code, which was pretty interesting. Uh, I recommend that to everyone interested. Um, so, what's actually next uh, to be done uh, with polar code? So, first of all, get the merge into mainline and radio. So, uh, it should be easier for all of you to uh, use polar code. Then, uh, while I was working at it, you saw uh, this performance comparison. And so this DR graph code or simulation code really uh, wants to be uh, rewritten, I guess, because uh, there are some things uh, that can go terribly wrong a lot of times. And actually, uh, for example, the bus ports that are used there uh, tend to uh, crash your flow graph irreversibly. So I have to. Uh, do some git checkouts for my TRC uh, files at some point. Well, then, uh, something personal. I am about to finish my master thesis and I'm going to get a uh, job. Uh, at this point, I'd like to say thanks. Uh, it was a great opportunity to uh, work on this project as a so this soon and uh, I also am very happy that I'm here today and for the whole week for the radio conference. Um, that's my presentation of Polygon. Thank you for your attention. Are there any questions? I have a quick applause. Simulations. How long are your packets, or how many bits were you sending, and, and what sort of convolution code were you comparing to? Uh, yeah, to make them comparable, they were all uh, at uh, a rate of 0.5, um, and I think they were all like uh, block size of 2048, and the convolution code was about the same size. Any further questions? No? Okay, that's it. I've got another round of applause for you.